Uh, so I thought maybe we could start out by just if, if someone's totally lost already, um, thinking about the argument from contingency and maybe can you distinguish that for us? Um, how is that different than like Kalam cosmological arguments? Sure. So it's sometimes called the Kalam or first cause argument. Um, that argument says uh, something like everything that begins to exist has a cause, but mm -hmm. the universe began to exist. So the universe has a cause. Um, in contrast to this, the, the argument from contingency is usually framed in terms of explanations rather than causes. Mm -hmm. Cause and explanation are closely linked concepts. So sometimes we end up talking about causes along the way, but you start out with explanation. You say the the kind of the physical universe or all, all this stuff here, it's it's contingent, meaning it didn't have to exist. Mm -hmm. There didn't have to be a physical universe. Certainly there didn't have to be this exact physical universe with this exact history. Uh, and so why is the universe as it is? And the argument from contingency wants to uh, to kind of say that we need some explanation outside the universe that's going to be the ultimate explanation of why the universe exists. Mm -hmm. Now, kind of the backstory to this paper is that um, I'm, I kind of, in terms of what I wrote my PhD on and in terms of uh, what I did kind of most of my earlier work on, I've been, I'm primarily a historian of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about historical figures like Leibniz, uh, like Thomas Aquinas, who, Samuel Clark, who pushed this argument from contingency. Yeah. And something that's interesting is that all of them say one of the advantages of this argument from contingency is that you don't have to prove that the universe has a beginning in time in order mm -hmm. to use this argument. Yeah. So the, the Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides and then Thomas Aquinas, they both say, we know from the Bible that the universe has a beginning in time, but we can't actually prove that by reason to an atheist who doesn't believe in the Bible. Yeah. And so we need an argument that doesn't depend on that premise mm -hmm. because the atheist uh, won't accept it and we don't have any rational way of making them accept it. And that's why the Kalam argument doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so and then Leibniz and Clark later, they say the same thing that we that even if the universe is goes back forever, still we can infer the existence of God by the argument from contingency. Mm -hmm. But if you look at people pushing the argument from contingency today, like Timothy O'Connor, for instance, they often still end up talking about a cause of the origination of the universe. Mm. And so then, not, not you know whether their argument works or not, right. it doesn't have the advantage that the classical proponents of the argument from contingency um, said that it had. Yeah. Uh, and then it kind of gets into this mess about how are we to understand in kind of contemporary Big Bang cosmology, how are we to understand the finite age of the universe? Is there more to physical reality than our universe that started with our Big Bang? Um, is there really kind of a first moment? And does that matter to the argument? Yeah. You know, all this all this stuff, really interesting, complicated stuff. Big time. Like yeah. Physics and philosophy of physics, right? Yeah. Um, but the, the clam... Uh, argument or first cause argument gets deep into the weeds of that. And I kind of suspect that it might actually be undermined when you look closely enough mm. at, the, at the physics there. Okay. But the argument from contingency doesn't depend, isn't supposed to depend on any of that. Yeah. Right. It's supposed to ask this question as Derek Parfit put it in the title of an essay, why anything, why this, <laughs> right. It's, so good. It's, it's the question it starts with. Um, and and we're supposed to be able to to kind of infer uh, a let's say a non naturalistic explanation of the natural world standing outside the natural world by asking and answering that question. Yeah. Oh, so I I love to to think of uh, like the Kalam is like you know the start to the race. Like why you know it's it had to have a start and and contingency arguments are like wow well, whatever man maybe maybe it's an infinite race maybe it's always been but why what's holding up the track why is you know yeah. why is this grounded at all like yeah sure you could trace it back I don't I don't care trace it back as far as back as you want or keep going but there's something undergirding this whole race going on so that's right. all like I mean it's super simplistic right but yeah I yeah. I love that yeah well and I love the the example that Leibniz gives when he talks about this. Hmm. Uh, I just love because 
So Leibniz talks about the book uh, Euclid's Elements of Geometry, yeah, which was something like would still have been used as a textbook when Leibniz was learning geometry as a, a child. And, and Leibniz, of course, is co-discoverer of calculus. So he's big into geometry, right? Yeah. It's an important yeah. book for him. And it would have been 2000 years old when he was using it. And so his copy would have been copied from a previous copy, from a previous copy, from a previous copy, you know, long before the invention of printing, mm-hmm. back and back to Euclid. And Leibniz says, uh, you know, imagine that Euclid didn't really write the book either. Imagine that Euclid copied it from a previous copy, which was copied from a previous copy, and so on forever. And Leibniz says, look, we still want to know, why were there ever any books in the first place? Why were they written like this? Why are they full of valid proofs and not invalid ones? Why is it a math book and not a novel? (laughs) There's there's so many other ways this could have been. Um, And and the fact that each one's copied from from a preceding one doesn't answer any of those questions. Um, Leibniz has a deterministic view of the universe. So he thinks you can think of kind of the universe just like that. Each state at each time is copied from the previous state. You can just read it off if you're you're good enough at physics or whatever. Yeah. Leibniz thinks. Uh, But that doesn't explain why the whole sequence is as it is, because there's so many other ways it could be. Yeah. That's so good. I I love, um, I'm glad you brought up the, your your past as a a historian of philosophy, because it comes through in your papers where you'll just drop in like these nuggets from the history of philosophy. And I love that. I, sometimes people, um, sometimes I get, I get crap for that because I add in too much in my philosophy papers and like, dude, just give me the argument. I don't want to hear, but I love, I love when you're adding this extra, like it enriches it. Um, and you could probably just be, well, you know, as we all, as we all know, Leibniz says, but then you throw in like a nice chunk from Leibniz or something. And I really appreciate that. So I, I love the way yeah. you write. 